Hello, everybody, and welcome to the program. It's so good to be here with you on Thursday, September 10th. And as you may or may not be aware of, today is Worldwide Suicide Awareness Day. So we pay tribute to all those who have departed due to death by suicide. We also acknowledge all of you who are going through just difficult times and are just very aware of all the the challenges and different experiences people are facing in today's very noisy world. And I am just so excited for the program we have for you today. So 11 years ago, when I was going through my dark nights of the soul, I read a book that's called The Unquiet Mind. And, you know, all my life, I was looking for success. Because when I was 12 years old, I started asking myself, why is it that some people are more successful than others? Why is it that some people seem so happy and alive, and yet others simply lead lives, as Thoreau said, of quiet desperation? And so my quest started to be successful. And, you know, in my life, I've achieved different modicums of success, but I have to tell you, that's not happiness. And so a few years ago, I made a conscious decision to find a quiet mind. and then. I actually found a book recently called Quiet Mind, and it has blown my world apart. And I'm just so, so excited to share this message with you today. As we get started today, our program is being sponsored today by StreamYard. Put the power of live streaming to work for your business, your brand, or your cause. Go to StreamYardCause.com right now, StreamYardCause.com, and put the power of live streaming to work for your business. You could be streaming to stream uh, to LinkedIn, to YouTube, to Facebook, to Periscope, and all those live streaming platforms. Go to StreamYardCause.com, sign up for your free account, and get a $10 credit. That's StreamYardCause.com. StreamYardCause.com. All right. Are you ready for this? My guest is a thriving executive life coach and spiritual teacher. For the last 26 years, he has coached thousands of top performers to achieve enlightened prosperity. His books, videos, audios, and seminars utilize his street-tested methodology called the Rapid Enlightenment Process. He is the author of this book right here. It's a game changer. Maybe if I turn it around for you. This book right here, Quiet Mind, Epic Life. And it's a bestseller in the United States, Canada, Australia, and Japan. See, I'm just so excited. I I didn't know if I was coming or going. You've got to buy this book. This is a must-have for your success library. So our guest today joins us from an undisclosed location in Southern California. Please, friends, put our hands together and help me welcome Matthew Ferry. Welcome to the program, Matthew. Yeah, glad I'm here, and I'm, uh, I'm hoping we're going to inspire some people to take on their own quiet mind. I, I tell you what, I always thought it was an original thought to have a quiet mind. As I was said in my introduction, I read that book, The Unquiet Mind, and thought, how powerful would it be to actually have a quiet mind? And I thought that was an original thought. And it's amazing how synchronicity and just the flow of life works. And recently, I uh, w- I was led to your book. And then like a day later, all of a sudden, you popped up on podcastguest.com. I devoured your book. I've listened to it twice on audio in the, ca- in the car. Uh, I mean, I've got it, you know, tagged and dog-eared and underlined and I'll tell you it's uh I sincerely mean this it's been a game changer so I'm wow. so glad you're here so t- thanks for taking time out of your I'm busy so glad world that I actually it. took the time to get all these thoughts down it was uh, yeah. it was one of those moments where I I just looked at my wife Kristen and said I better get all of this out of my head and and into some pages because there's some incredible things that are happening for me in my own awareness. So how did this book come through you recently? Well, it started when I was nine. So when I was nine years old, I, I, I began having these incredible moments where I felt like I was floating above my body and I, I didn't know what it was. Um, you know, I was nine, uh, but there was so much bliss and so much peace and so much joy I just felt like I had to figure out how to get there again. And I was fortunate to be born into a personal development family. My father is a, is a real estate uh, personal development guru, essentially. 
And my, my quest just drove me. And ultimately in my 30s, I began to discern a very specific way to get the mind to get back to that place again of peace and joy and flow. And it turns out, you know, pretty much it's, it's not a, uh, it, it's not a unique thing. Most of us just want to feel peace and joy and certainty and love and confidence. And that's really what comes with a quiet mind. How long did this book take to come through you? Obviously in a way it had come through you your entire life, but how, how long did it take to actually manifest it and put it into paper? It was probably about a six week process, but, uh, wow. um, once we, once we wrote the book, then, it, then both Kristen and I just went in and, and tore every sentence apart and tore every paragraph apart and just made sure that it, it really represented and spoke clearly what it was that I was trying to communicate. Most of my life, I've been a coach and a trainer and a, and a speaker. So get, you know, distilling it down into words that, that aren't, um, you know, uh, me just narrating was quite quite a project, but I'd say about six weeks to get it all onto the page. Yeah, that's amazing. That's that's epic in and of itself, if anybody out there has ever written a book. So that just shows you your consciousness was flowing and that the great things were happening as you manifested that. So it was, it was, literally, was, like, a, it was literally a transcription. I was, I was, it was just, and, I, and I'd been working on it for so long and I'd, I'd coached so many people through the process that it wasn't a, it wasn't a difficult process for me to get it down. I like that. It was a transcription. Yeah, that, and, and that's how it would work. Absolutely. Uh, Matthew and I were talking in the pre-show before the broadcast started that I believe I had actually met his dad in the late 80s when I started working with Brian Tracy. And who knows, we may have actually met back then. But let's Probably. start with the premise that your book makes a very strong, bold statement. And, and you caught my attention with this. When you said this book may very well be the last thing you need to have enrich your life and you may never go back to personal development again. Talk right. a little bit about that bold statement that you're saying that maybe you don't need to pursue personal development if you really understand what you're talking about in this work. So the the re, the statement is really that when your mind goes quiet, there's nothing left to fix. There's nothing left to improve. There's nothing left for you. Don't, you don't need to gain anymore. So will you continue to have a desire to learn? Of course, that's you are, you're a learning type of person. That's why you're watching this broadcast. That's why you're reading these books. But from a personal development standpoint, you'll no longer be trying to figure out what's going on with your personality because you will have actually transcended your personality. You'll no longer, you'll no longer be bothered by the negative thoughts and the, and the, um, let's call it fears and doubts and concerns. Those things will have, have mostly moved to the background. So all the work that we do in personal development, um, has us try to, to fix those thoughts. And I did that for a long time, but ultimately what I realized is that the only way out is to transcend the need to think altogether so that you can then think clearly when you want to. It's just such a powerful concept. And I know there are a lot of people who watch and listen to this program who will subscribe to the whole positive affirmations and we just need to think more positively. And I love how you say in the book that that's like, that's like planting a rose garden over the top of the sewer. The, and and there's actually science to back it up. So there's a, a a study that was done at Harvard where they used a cell phone app and they had people just log what was going on with their thinking. What they found was is that when the mind is idle, it just defaults to the negative. That the mind's natural state is a negative, concerned, fearful state. And I found that exact same thing. I have uh, over the years, you know, I've, I've coached literally thousands of people and my job was to help them to be more productive. And of course, I found that I had to help them with their mindset. I had to help them to get their their thinking clear. And we would do all those traditional techniques. You have to remember that my father's mentor was Earl Nightingale. And then my father was my mentor. So I, I come from this lineage and yet, when I put those ideas to the test, 
they had merit. They, they, they worked to a point, but my mind was still antagonistic. My mind would still just bubble up with negativity, no matter how much I trained it to be positive. Well, let's talk about a couple of the myths that you bust in your book. So let's talk about these two. I'll put them up and then you run with it and talk about it a little bit more. So the first myth is I can rewire my brain by eliminating negative thoughts and replacing them with positive thoughts. How is that a myth? Well, the truth is that uh, nobody has really put it to the test in a way that is conclusive. So that's number one. It's uh, it's one of those things in, in personal development where uh, this mentor said it, so then that mentor said it, and then their student said it, and then their student just kept going and going and going. And, and while I am 100% a proponent of thinking in a positive and constructive fashion, what I have discerned over the years, and I'm, and you have to remember, cause I had a business of positive affirmations in my twenties. Sure. I'm the, my most successful music album is a positive affirmation music album. I was a devotee. And yet over the years, I was not able to get the mind to permanently stay in a positive state. The mind cannot be uh, a tool of positivity. You can, you can train it, train it, train it, train it. You can get it pretty close. But in the end, the mind will always de default back to the negative because your mind is a survival system. So you're literally using the wrong tool. The game is to transcend the mind and to connect with your consciousness, with your, with your ultimate self. And when you do that, then you find that the mind says negative things and you think it's funny. And the mind is worrisome and fearful and it's entertaining, but it's not all encompassing. It doesn't drag you around. It is unfortunately a myth. Transcendence is the actual process. It's amazing to me how many people still believe that they are their thoughts, but we choose whether or not we're going to listen to the monkey mind. And as you say so well in your book, the drunk monkey mind, we can talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but we are not our thoughts. We do not have to subscribe to the lies unless we choose to. And you can't stop your thoughts. Your thoughts just keep coming and coming and coming and coming because you are a thinking machine. And it, it isn't until you remove the motivation for thinking altogether. And that's something that I go over in my book. I talk about the hidden motives to survive. When you remove the survival motive, your mind has no reason to talk. Your mind talks because some survival motive is activated. And when that is deactivated and you're in a state of peace and oneness and, and you know that all is well, then all of a sudden you can really, you, you not only are you at peace, but you are creative, you're resourceful, you're empowered, you can kick ass, you feel good, you're energized. It's, it's absolutely incredible. And, and I spent years and years and years and years and years trying to control my thoughts. Decades, really. And it wasn't until I removed the motivation, I, I literally recontextualized the motivation for the thinking altogether, that the mind went quiet. And when it went quiet, it, it was one of those moments. <laughs> it's one of those moments that that changed everything. And I, I was seeking that. I really was seeking that. And then I listened to uh, Michael Singer's Untethered Soul and then the Surrender yes. Experiment. And I had a couple of instances of exactly that. Yes. And then I was listening to your audio of Unquiet Mind, or rather Quiet Mind Epic Life. And I had one of those moments. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you, if no one has ever had that moment when you are in just total, like you're talking about enlightenment, bliss, quiet or whatever, when you just don't hear the chirping of the, the, the flock or herd of monkeys running across the trees in your head. The truth. That is just the most fascinating, fulfilling, beautiful experience. I would like to think maybe that's what the Buddha was talking about when he talked about enlightenment, but I want us all to know it's possible, but now I crave it. I crave yeah. to be able to duplicate that 
at will. And I haven't been able to do it at will. I know it's going to take a lot of practice, but unbelievable, powerful. And there was one point in your book that I think really did, did it for me. And I had to pull over, but it's that whole part where you're talking about the dogmas. And I really had to analyze what is it that I believe and what dogmas and status quos and beliefs have I been living up to, so to speak. And it was so liberation. It was so liberating. I almost, I mean, I wrote down, I know in August when my personal liberation day was. So let's talk about that specifically because that ties into myth number two. When I achieve my goals, I enjoy my success and I will finally have the peace. What a belief system we're all subscribing to. And it's not true. And because we're not achieving certain things right now during COVID, look at the state we're in. Yeah. It's in our face. Um, I've had the uh, good fortune to to spend a vast majority of my coaching and personal development uh, career working with the top people. I started off working with the top people in real estate agency. And then in 2003, I began working with people on Wall Street. And when I started working with people on Wall Street, these were people who had hundreds of millions, you know, uh, uh, up to billions of dollars. And yet they were still in this frantic state, like someday, well, you know what? I have a billion now. I need to get two billion. I need to get three billion. They have, they were in this frantic state, constantly trying to, to um, optimize for more, 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 more. And when my mind went quiet back in, in uh, 2006, I began to discern these hidden motives. And one of the motives that was very present was the motive of greed. And greed is a phenomenal, amazing, extraordinary survival technique and an evolutionary phenomenon. And, and I am so glad that we humans have it. But, you know, you look around, look at a squirrel. A squirrel has got greed. They're just gathering up as much as they, all the acorns that they possibly can. And it turns out they don't, they don't even find them all, but they're just compelled. And we are compelled. We are compelled to get more, have more, be more. But when you begin to back up and you ask yourself why, Ultimately, what you will discern is that you're trying to optimize for survival and you cannot achieve a thriving state if you are activating a survival mode. You can't be greedy enough to be satisfied. And we all try. We all try to do it. But I promise you, it doesn't work. The game is to be at peace now and then go kick ass and do some great stuff and, and achieve and accomplish and do all the fun things that you want to do. I think it's so liberating to be at peace and then to go after and do all the things that, that are interesting and exciting and, and, and worthy. But to do them hoping that I will then ultimately be worthy and be at peace and feel good, uh, unfortunately, it's an illusion. It's a myth. And it's interesting you talk about greed actually comes from a scarcity mentality where many would believe greed is all about, well, there's abundance and I got to go get it all. Where actually it's it's scarcity thinking saying, well, there's only so much and I got to go get my share. And if I don't, there will be some negative consequence. And that's really what we're talking about is that the, the survival motive Greed, grudge, hatred, victim, illogical rules, humble, traitor, uh, um, uh, pride, resistance. Those particular motivations all have contained within them a, I have to do this in order to avoid some kind of consequence. And most people don't realize that their, the, their entire life is unconsciously in avoidance. And when you begin to connect with the enlightened perspective that we're all one thing expressing itself with infinite variety, and you begin to connect with this idea that all is well, suddenly all those motivations just evaporate. And you were talking about chapter nine in my book, which is the um, uh, examining the dogma that we, that we subscribe to sort of whether we want to or not. And it is when you transcend, when you analyze the dogma and you transcend it, that all of a sudden you come to these places where you're like, wait a second, all is well. 
There's nothing for me to do. There's nowhere to go. There, I don't have to. I don't have to accomplish anything. And then all of a sudden, you're like, "Well, what do I want to accomplish? Where do I want to go? What do I want to do?" You're no longer driven by something that you can't explain. You now are a person who is making a choice, and that is what enlightenment gives you. It gives you a choice. It's really spectacular. Don't you believe that most people live in must, should, that whole dialogue, I have to do this, I must do this, I should do this. We got to stop shouldn't on ourselves. Find that quiet mind and then just live at a higher level. It's possible. It's not only, it's not only possible, but if you are tuned into this broadcast and and you're still with us right now and this is intriguing to you it's not only possible it's probable that 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 the words that we are talking about and and the words that we're using and we're saying and the concepts and the ideas if those things are compelling to you uh, it's game over it's just a matter of time before you find your way to optimize for peace and flow and then the question becomes do you want to optimize for peace and flow and then get out there and have an amazing life in the process because you don't have to optimize for peace and flow and, and then and then not do anything else. That doesn't make any sense. But these should, shouldn't, have to, must, need to, these are these are all uh causal relationships that are are not actually real. They when examined, they're all they all turn out to be false. Yeah, we lie to ourselves a lot, don't we? Not on purpose. I mean, I if if you just examine your thoughts, you discover that your your thinking is optimized for survival. But you're living in a world now where the things that you used to have to protect yourself against are no longer there. Sure. Most of the things that we, that give us stress and anxiety and upset and frustration aren't actually um, dangerous. They're just they might be suboptimal. It might be that you don't prefer it. But if you just examine the thinking, when you just begin to see the thinking for what it is, you see, ah, there's a, there's a mechanism, there's a biological mechanism like my heart or my lungs that is in this perpetual state of trying to guide me away from negative stuff and towards positive things. And it's software was developed over millions of years and we have hit an exponential in our world. And the exponential is giving rise to this idea that it's no longer necessary to be in a survival consciousness. Let's share what's on the screen and dig just a little deeper in this because I have this yeah. now written down several places in my house where I see it all the time. Enlightenment is the rec recognition that the source of life within you is the source of life in everyone and everything else. We are all one thing expressing itself with infinite variety. Imagine if we all truly understood that. We would not have the chaos. We would not have so many of the conditional issues that we're having in society today with the civil unrest and everything, if we all just realized we all come from the same infinite source. Well, and that, and that infinite source is not woo woo. It's not religious. It's, it's, uh, it's unbelievably pragmatic. There are, uh, I don't know, something like 35, 36 um, sort of uh, elementary uh, subatomic particles. Those particles are self assembling into everything that we experience. We don't know how they self-assemble or why they self-assemble. We don't know why there, uh, there is both a destructive and constructive force. Uh, but the, all of these elements, when they are oscillating, that's how I visualize oscillating. I'm not sure that that's actually scientific, but when they are oscillating, it creates everything that we are experiencing. And, and, and everything that I'm looking at right now, as I look out into the forest, everything that I see is essentially the same stuff that I am. It's just configuring or being configured in a totally different way. But we're all connected through time and space in this background vacuum. And the vacuum then gives rise to all of, the, all of these particles, which are creating everything. I mean, there is there's a, a scientific 
basis to the idea. And of course, I'm bastardizing it. Don't don't look at me as a scientist. I'm just a, a science nerd is probably what I am. Uh, but in the end, when you practice the idea, and that's all this is, when you practice the idea that we are all one thing expressing itself with infinite variety, when you practice it, everything changes. When you practice total and complete acceptance of all people in all situations at all times, including yourself, everything changes. You, the old you cannot survive it. Even this conversation that we're having right now, as you listen to us speak, it becomes this, this beacon, like this. there's this thing that happens inside of you and it just starts changing you. All there is to do is to start practicing these ideas that are coming through. And, and they're not just coming through me, they're coming through all kinds of people. Whatever this background energy and information is, whatever it is, it is expressing itself in this way right now. And you happen to be, right now, tuned in to what this is. I was getting a little wacky there. No, no, it, it just totally makes sense. And there is just so much power in this. And it's interesting, years ago, I read this book, and I know you talk about it in yours. Oh, yeah. uh, and, and when I first saw this book, Power Versus Force by David Hawkins, I was blown away. And if no one has read this before, in the, in the section in the middle, there's actually this graph. This and I don't have the graphic of it, so we'll just go with it this way. But it's this map of consciousness. And I'll tell you, that started me on a journey. And then you talked about it in your work. And it's amazing how all this just dovetails together so, so beautifully. Uh, he oh, had yeah. a big impact on your life, didn't he? Uh, absolutely profound. I, I would say uh, the the three biggest mentors for me in my life were um, Dr. David Hawkins, uh, a man named Stephen Sadler, who's a, a meditation teacher, and then my father, Mike Ferry. And those, those three people uh, really shaped me. But what I love about Doc Hawk, that's what I call him, Doc Hawk. Doc Hawk. Uh, what I love about Doc Hawk is that he mapped consciousness in a way and then gave us a tool to, to conduct our own investigation. And when you, when you uh, dig into my book, especially in chapter nine, you see that I began to utilize the, the tool, the applied kinesiology to discern, well, what would be a strengthening way to think about this or what would be a weakening way to think about it? And then could, could I go out into the world and make sure that if it was strengthening on me, that it's strengthening on everyone. And it, it was about a 10 year project. Uh, but at the, at the completion, you see that those 36 thoughts that I put in there uh, really help you to connect with the idea that all is well. Like when you really connect with the transcending of dogma that I talk about in that chapter, you just, it's like, it's like what happened to you? You were driving along or whatever happened. You had to like pull over and all of a sudden you were like, oh, and nothing was there. Nothing was going on. Nothing was happening in your mind. You were in a profound state of peace for no reason other than you were alive and and I you know I got to give props to Doc Hawk for uh, for teaching me that tool and and imparting his knowledge. Uh, I actually prefer his book that he wrote after this called Eye of the Eye, and and I've been reading that book uh, over and 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 over for some about fifteen years now. The powerful part, and uh, obviously you wrote the book, so you know a chapter and verse. Uh, I believe it is that chapter nine. Specifically, so I'm driving along and you're going through your muscle testing exercise. And I, depending on how much you want to talk about that here, but when you got to that point where existence on earth is a vacation, that just resonated with me. And I thought, what if we looked at life? Instead of, and, and I yeah. know the Buddha says all of life is human suffering. And so people come here and say, oh, you know, life is, you know, I come here to learn certain lessons and I come to be tested and tried. But what if we changed that belief to just say, you know what? We chose to come here 
And life is a vacation from the eternities. And we here we are just in this moment, this little vacation of yep. 70, 80, 90 years. Wow, that changed everything. Yeah, well, I don't know. So first of all, um, it's not a true statement. It's a, it is a dogmatic statement that life is suffering. Uh, it's not a true statement. Uh, it is also a dogmatic statement that life is a vacation and, and a holiday. And, and the investigation that I've been on uh, with literally thousands and thousands of coaching clients, the investigation has been, well, if, for example, you muscle test on someone, like you push down on their arm and you say the word love, it strengthens them. And if you say the word hate, it weakens them. And uh, it does take some practice to get your body to get out of survival. You can't be in survival when you're doing it. But that's, a, that's for, <laughs> read my book, I'll explain what I'm talking about. But it really comes down to this. I just started to put ideas to the test and say, okay, well, what strengthens people? What weakens people? And it, it was a real shocker when the idea came to my mind that life was a vacation. It, it was also like a, a big, and that was strong. It was also incredibly perplexing when every single person I tested, life is suffering went weak. Life is a test went weak. Life is uh, about learning lessons went weak. In fact, life is, and then put any other word behind it and it will cause your physiology to malfunction and you will go weak. I don't know why. Okay. So I don't propose to know why, but it I was fascinated by this. And the more I did it, the quieter my mind got. And so it, it was the discovery of this idea that life is an experience. Yes. And as soon as I got to life as an, as an experience, it opened up an entirely new framework because now suddenly I could experience anything. And, and now the, and really what we're talking about is the, the purpose of life, right? So that was the actual words. The purpose of life is to experience. And when you get that framework, in other words, I'm going to say it like this. When you practice, when you practice that perspective, you practice the perspective, life sucks. Life is a pain in the ass. People are hard to deal with. You practiced all of those things. When you actually begin to practice different contextual frameworks, not affirmations, contextual frameworks, it's something that I call recontextualization. When you practice these contextual frameworks, it shifts your reaction. It shifts your behavior. It is absolutely extraordinary how fast your mind will go quiet and how quickly you enter into what we would traditionally call an enlightened state. No meditation required. And don't get me wrong, I love meditation. So I, I, I geek out on meditation all the time, but that's not the way that you quiet your mind at Thanksgiving. Yeah, so I, I'll retrace what I said exactly that it's a, you know, a perspective, not that it's a vacation, yes, that it's, that's an experience, but just how you can frame life differently, that it's just an experience meant to be experienced good or bad it just is yeah. and and we've talked about this in a previous episode here on the program that most people are in the rapids of life in their little rubber raft just fighting the current and trying to stay on top of the white water and crashing into the rocks but when you just surrender yeah, I'm not saying life is a lazy river, but it just takes on a whole different experience when you just surrender to it and you go with the flow and you don't fight against life. Wow. It's like, I wish yeah. we could just bottle that up because that... Well, you, now you're in control. What you're describing is if you fight against what you resist will persist and what you accept will transform. So if I fight against the river, the river persists and it wears me out and, and it puts me into a survival state. But when I go with the flow of, of life, then I can direct it. I can transform it. I think that's what you're describing. Yeah. And you do a much better job of it than I did there. I get, you know, excited and my, uh, my mind uh, outpaces my lips in that respect. It's just, is so, 
so powerful. So thank you for that, for that understanding or the way you said it, that it just shifted for me a couple Sundays ago while I was driving. It was just, it was phenomenal. And then to your point, when, when that comes to you and you're just in the moment and you're like, this is just peace and my mind is quiet. I'm not fighting. I'm enjoying the experience. Let's, uh, let's put up a graphic of kind of what we're talking about. And you can explain specifically the difference then between, between this survival mind and this quiet mind. So you want to think about it like this. Most of us believe that the um, reaching the top of, of the pyramid of, of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is like the bomb.com. So we think that if we, if we come to this place where um, we're working on our self-realization that it's all it's all going to work out for us but it turns out that that is actually still a need we're still fulfilling a need and what what it takes is the complete and total recontextualization of your existence so down in the survival mind you're you're experiencing dogma that is both limiting and weakening and whenever you are weakened you go into a survival state and whenever you're in a survival state your mind talks that's so important. Whenever you are limited and weakened, you actually activate your thinking. When you apply the rapid enlightenment process, suddenly you transcend the needs altogether and you move up into these domains of the quiet mind. And really, the quiet mind is just a set of enlightened dogma. That's it. Unprovable. It's sort of like if you're going to believe things that aren't true, why not believe things? that empower you to be at peace. I love Most that. Of us Say that are, one more time. That That is so powerful. That is just so powerful. If you're going to believe things that aren't true, why not believe things that aren't true that empower you? It, Amen. Because to I your mean, point, how do yes. we really know what truth is anyway? So if you're going to have certain beliefs... Why not believe the good stuff? And and the thing is, is that we we are hell bent on on holding on to our bias. And really, what enlightenment is like, if you like pull it apart, it's about basically busting your bias and recognizing you don't know nothing. Everything you say, you know. You, I mean, there of course there is scientifically replicatable ideas. And there is stuff that has been through time, tried and true. But that's not what we're talking about. That's not what makes you miserable. That's not what makes you unhappy and agitated and fighting and angry. That's not what limits you and causes you to go into fear and doubt. Not the science that is provable. It's all the BS that you can't prove. You have no idea if it's true or not. But my God, we fight for it. And so ultimately what the muscle testing helped me to do was to take it out of my own perspective and see what the muscle will do. Will the muscle be strengthened? Will it be fortified or will it be weakened and will it be, will it be reduced in its integrity? And I've just been practicing thinking thoughts on purpose that are strengthening and that bring me peace. And I've been teaching people to do it now for the better part of a decade. And it's a system <laughs> and it, and it just works. So let's talk specifically more about the rapid enlightenment process. Then how let's do we do go it. beyond this drunk monkey mind, this survival mind up into these new enlightened dogmas to your point, if you're going to believe in something, why not believe in the good things and enjoy the experience? And I think it's important also uh, for the for the um, sarcastic mind to understand that if you're going to believe in things, why not believe things that are strengthening and empowering to you? That doesn't mean that you are stupid or impractical. It just means that all the stuff that you can't prove and, and is degrading to you 
you put it to the test. You 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 play around with it. You recontextualize it. The, the rapid alignment process has four steps. So step one in the rapid alignment process is to recognize that your mind is not your friend. Your mind is a biological mechanism. Its job is to survive. I call it the drunk monkey. That's my little nickname for it. And I'm always patting my head. Oh, I know, drunk monkey. You're so scared. <laughs> then... There's number two. Number two is to begin to understand or discern the motive. What's the motive for the mind to even talk? And it turns out that there are 10 hidden motives. The moment you hear about these hidden motives, it immediately makes sense. And you, you are, are jostling your relationship to them and they, they become uh, less uh, oppressive. And, and they, you start to remove these survival traits. Then number three is to simply practice enlightened perspectives. And an enlightened perspective is so simple. It assumes that all is well. It assumes that we're all one thing expressing itself with infinite variety. And then finally, the fourth component is to then recontextualize everything in your life. So you, and you don't, you don't even actually need to do that. It will just happen automatically. The moment you say to yourself, I'm going to live like my life is a soul having a vacation here on earth and that it's here to experience things. And the and that experience could be considered by my personality, good, bad, right, wrong, suffering, happiness, joy, whatever. But it's all an experience. The moment you start to connect to that idea, you then naturally, it's like what you said, you naturally start to recontextualize everything. Everything gets framed just a little differently and you experience the world in a completely new way without the reactions, without the anger, without the hostility, without the judgment or the, or the um, let's call it the like negative spin. That just starts to naturally go away. So those are the four steps. And typically, I would say that it's sort of like what you were experiencing. If you just go through the book or the audio book, you're going to have some pretty intense moments of quiet mind. And But if you practice this stuff for about 18 months or so, where you're just like being repetitive about it, it's crazy how quiet your mind will get. It's nuts. And it feels so good. And then then you have the opportunity to go out there and kick ass and live an epic life. And I, I'm a big fan of that. I'm a proponent. Well, and that totally makes sense that once you get that quiet mind, that everything you can do above and beyond that in that great abundance really is just magical. I mean, I know that's a crazy word to use, but it is. It's just it's it's unseen and it's that's it, where the great things happen in that state of consciousness. And it's just it's just powerful. And I invite everyone to yeah. to learn more about this, please, please and, do. And, and and could we also say that magical, uh, magical is really just describing when things work in an effortless fashion, and it's surprising because so often so many things in our life don't work, but when we go up in our consciousness and we stop resisting, things just start working better. Amen. Again, whatever we resist persists and when we finally decide that we're just not fighting anymore and we're going to surrender to certain things uh it's it's just it's just incredible uh let's talk about the see now this is a test because i think it's 28 days 23 23 23 days. okay yeah. my threes and eights look a lot here in my notes but talk about what these the 23 day practice is all about because yeah. that just solidifies everything. I think the important, the important thing for our viewer to understand about me is that I did not, I didn't have the, the luxury of being a luminary who uh, wrote books, but didn't actually have to put it into practical use with anybody. I didn't, I, I was, I've been a coach. I've been a coach for you know, 20 some years now. And so I'm at all times on the chopping block. Uh, what I do has to work. 
And if it doesn't, then I get fired. And now I got to go find a new client and, and uh, make sure that I can put food on the table for my family. And so over time, I have developed extremely practical, usable ways to get you to go into a state of peace, flow, productivity, and effectiveness. And those 23 practices are essentially just me doing a brain dump, right? Because I, I, they'd ne they had never really been written down before that. I, I would just be in the flow with a client and they would be going through some kind of issue that would block them from being the best version of themselves. And I'd say, hey, try this, try, try this idea. And then they would go and practice it in their world. They'd come back, give me feedback, and then I would just be optimizing. And so those 23 daily practices are essentially 20 plus years of me um, testing and optimizing the fastest ways to get you into a state of peace. Everyone is so powerful, but let's talk about one that just jumped out to me as I'm thumbing through here. And in today's world where, you know, people are just married to their screen and they watch their screen time go up and up and up. And especially now as we head into the height of political season, how many hours are spent on Facebook and people just fight and people are just so dug in on their opinions. I just love how simply this is said for day 22. Your opinion is the source of your suffering. And it, it comes on the heels of the 20 uh, day 21 enlightened perspective of God doesn't care or have an opinion on anything. I am whole, complete, and perfect exactly as I am. The only things that are wrong with me are arbitrary, illogical perceptions. All is well. We are the same thing expressed itself with infinite variety, but that our opinions are the cause of our suffering. When, when you said that, and I had to pause the recording, and I was like, that is so true. It's It's that suffering I find in my mind when I'm trying to justify my opinion, when I'm trying to live my opinion or dogmas, that is just so powerful that when we disconnect that our opinion really doesn't matter. Talk about peace. Yeah. Uh, your opinion is the source of your suffering and your opinion is, is generally based on um, arrogance, pride, misinformation. Um, opinions in general are not going to be conclusive and, and they are predominantly divisive and the source of strife for us. Uh, and therefore, it is extraordinarily effective to state things as, this is my opinion. I don't have any basis for it. There's no reality or truth to it. But it's the thing that I'm holding on to in this moment. So I might, let's say I'm... I'm in some kind of political conversation. It's okay for me to be in a political conversation as an American, for example. Um, it is, it's like one of my rights to be able to express what I think about how this country should be run. But to think that, <laughs> to pretend that what I'm speaking is the truth is completely irrational. And all it does is create conflict. And when I create conflict, I put myself into a survival state. When I create conflict, I weaken my system. And I know that my system is weak because my mind starts talking. I start justifying, rationalizing. I start ramping up the argument. Then I leave the conversation. And now I'm having the conversation with myself as if the person is still there. This is just the mind doing its job. When you practice giving up your opinion or just at least acknowledging, this is just my opinion. In my opinion, it's like your opinion. It's just a bunch of BS and we hope that it's true and that we have no conclusive evidence. And really, if I'm being honest, it's my preference. That's really what it is. Yeah, if I, I just that. acknowledge I just, that it's my preference, I'm I'm off to the races. Yeah, I. that's just powerful. Even if you just led with that, my preference is, that just frames something different in your mind. But think yeah. about what we're going through in this country. The literal civil war we are experiencing right now because people are so entrenched, so in love with those opinions and they believe that it's 100% true and right. And, you know, we're, we're literally killing each other over these opinions. And to your point, 
who knows what really is true? I think that there is a great merit in in speaking up and saying what you how you want the world to be. And I am also really, really uh, clear that that's divisive and that that you will create resistance. And I, I think that the that America itself and, and it feels like the world in general is going through a phenomenally productive cycle right now. And yeah. that all of this destruction is the beginning of creation, that creation is the rearranging of what is already there. And when people think about creation, they think, oh, they, they think of the end result and how beautiful it was. Creation is downs. And I think that it's just imperative for all of us to really embrace that destruction and creation are the same thing, just at a different place in the timeline. It's so powerful. Just so powerful. What else can our viewers and listeners do to take a few more steps. Well, they can they certainly get my life. book. They should definitely do that. Well, they that's can. a given. Anybody who watches or listens to this program and does not buy your book, then I have failed <laughs> in my <laughs> in my ability to communicate what a what a game changer this is. But until they're, you know, because we we have to have it up absolutely positively overnight and with prime, you know, it's going to be two days before they get it on their doorstep. Matthew. So yeah. what's one or two other things that they the can thing do? That, if you go to my website, matthewferry.com, uh, you can, you can scroll down the list of stuff that I have and in there you can get my app. And in my app, I have all kinds of free training videos, audios and, and um, articles and books and everything. I just, I, I do my best to give away a giant chunk of what I do so that people can really benefit from it. But in my app, you can start the 23 daily practice now. And I do it in video form and audio form for you. So I would highly recommend that you you go download my app ASAP. You can also just go straight to the um, uh, you know, Google store or the Apple store and you'll, you'll be able to download it immediately. Yeah, you've got a lot of great resources here at matthewferry.com. Well, I hope this has been enough for everyone to whet their appetites of what's what's definitely possible because I, I've just been so excited. And again, how this all came together was just amazing. One, la one guest led to another, which led to another, which led to this book and then that book. And, and then, like I said, I picked up Unquiet Mind when I saw the, the, the cover. I was like, that's what I've been a seeking. That's been the quest for years is to get this quiet mind, epic life. And then when I listened to it and re-listened to it, then I got the book, started reading it, underlining it, tearing it apart, taking notes. It's just amazing how, whether you call it synchronicity or, you know, just the magic of the universe, how different things are attracted and manifested. It has, it has just been a wonderful ride the last couple of weeks. And you've been right in the middle of all that. So I really Yay. appreciate that. Well, I feel very blessed and very honored that we got to be connected, and I hope that we can remain connected in some way. Well, I'll tell you, I hope everyone will will take this invitation that I extend personally. Invest in yourself. Not only get the book, because reading is to the mind, is exercises to the body, but also just the way you 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 communicate in your audible. I'm a big fan of Audible, being an Audible narrator and doing books on Audible. I'm just a big fan of that. And we're just not reading and consuming enough. So if you're one of those people who's saying, oh, I just don't have time to read, I'm going to call bullshit on that philosophy yep. and say you spend 500 to 1,000 hours in your car, maybe not right now during COVID, but whether you're on the treadmill or doing dishes, it's a seven, eight hour book. It will, I promise you it will change your life. And I don't say that about a lot of books or a lot of programs. This is a life changer. It will change the way you believe about yourself. It will help you see the world differently. Therefore, you're going to make different choices on how you react and you respond to what happens in your world. And when you actually feel like you are 
I, I don't want to say you're in control of everything, but all is well and you're okay with just the way the world is manifesting things to you. It has a new special flavor that is just that is just so savory and juicy that you want it every single day. Hallelujah, man. I totally yeah. agree. Uh, I, I am so excited about waking up every day and being in this state. And I just hope that we reach out and find those others who are ready to take that on too. It's just going to be so delicious. Delicious. That is the word delicious life can be delicious we are here to experience life so let's embrace it and let's make the very very best of it matthew ferry at matthewferry.com thank you so much for enlightening us today and giving everyone just that little teeny costco piece of cheese on the toothpick mm -hmm. enough now that they'll be behind the curtain and order the book and download the audible and get on a journey towards a more enlightened uh, enlightened path for their own lives. It's uh, it's it 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 is delicious. So thank you, my friend. I really appreciate you being with us today on the program. Thank you, and thanks everybody for tuning in. And keep shining brightly, everyone, because someone out there needs to be guided by your light. Have a great day. Subscribe to Cause TV. And listen to the Cos Green audio experience on iTunes and Spotify.